but I'm a professor. I look around my classes now, and I see almost all women. And I see men almost, or boys almost, afraid to, to speak out. Yes, uh, but, it's, but, a, it's just a total well, reversal. Let's explore that. Hang on. Let's explore that. We, Why we, are they afraid to speak up? Pardon? Yeah. Why are Good they question. afraid to speak up? Well, I, first of all, it's, if they say what they feel, it's probably going to be totally politically incorrect. So they don't do that. Um, and maybe it's just having the numbers uh, uh, overwhelming them. I don't know. But it, I have noticed that over my teaching career of 30 years, a really big change in were, this uh, were you case. Ian, Ian, sorry. 30, 30, 30 years is longer than three months. The, the three months I spent wandering around Canadian campuses to write about this recently. But the men I spoke to said that the, the reason why I'm not rushing through is I don't have to rush through anymore, and I don't want to rush through anymore. I don't want to be like my father and come out of high school, go to university, come out of university, go to a job, and spend my life enslaved in a job for a long time. Many of the women said that they felt a sense of you know, a, an urgency to get into it very, 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 very quickly. So, so thanks uh, to I, feminism, everybody's got more choice. I, I honestly That's think so. Like. Walter, you had a question. I wanted to ask uh, the professor, were you uh, an academic, I take it you were, at the time when there were cadres of women coming into classes and shouting professors down? Do you remember that era? Well, I, I never experienced it personally, but I've heard about it, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. were, those were you, those were women. When, when well, kings were beheading think. their their wives well, when they didn't like them? What's I mean, the point? So that must well, have those, those women are now doctors and engineers and lawyers and judges. But maybe behaving better? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's a whole other topic that we ought to get into. But, but you understand what happens to men in divorce courts on issues of custody and access. Uh, th this is an issue that, for, I'm not trying to play amateur psychologist here, trust me, but there feels like there's a lot of anger just below the surface in you on this. Well, is that fair I, to say? I, I deal with so many men in this situation, and, and uh, as part of the work that I do with the, the clients that I service who, who are organized to try to change these things, it, it is frustrating when something is as clear and as simple as the fact that mother will get custody almost no matter what happens. And with the custody goes the house, and with the house goes child support and goes spousal support. And if some guy is in his early days of his career or in the mid-career and has children and gets into that predicament, he may as well go live with his parents in the basement of their house because all of his money is going out to support his wife, his ex-wife or estranged wife, the children, and he may or may not get okay. to see the but, children. But tell me this. is the the theory of all of this is supposed to be what's best for the kids. What's mm -hmm. best for the kids, they say, is, is to have... What's, is a, what's best for mother. That's what feminism has brought us in issues of custody and access. So it's all, it, But if the, kids, if, if the kids' issues are being dealt with first and foremost... Well, that's what you would hope is being done, but the shorthand is that father pays and mother wins all. It's a winner-take-all system. Is that you your understanding? You want to liberate women, give custody to men. David, is that your understanding of how it works as well? Yes, that is my understanding of how it works. But I don't, I don't have it be the same. I, I don't think feminism did that. I think that that's a result of those long-standing chivalry that when men's and women's issues come into conflict, women should, women should triumph. Just the same way that when men's and women's lives are at risk, men save women. It's the same thing going on in family court. I, I'm inclined to agree with Dave that it's, David, it's not uh, feminism that's brought that, but feminism hasn't touched that. That's a position that women have had all yeah. along, and in this new equal world where all we hear from feminists is talk about equality, there's no equality in that area. They're not giving that up. Hmm. Walter, do you, um, there's a lot of all sports channels out there, right? Yes. Which spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week pumping up men and showing them as heroes and glorified and so on and so forth. Well, Do you have to, not just, I mean, humor this premise here okay. for a second, but because, because there is all of that, right. is there a sense that society has to somehow balance it off in other ways by showing men in less than glorious ways? If, you're giving me the pendulum argument. I take it, right? It was, one, it was over here before, and it's over here now. And then there's this shift, and we have to balance things off. I worry. I worry if we haven't moved ourselves into some kind of a pre-fascist system where there's a notion that men are bad and women are good, and you just have to add an adjective to the definition of men, uh, tall men, short men, whatever, are bad, and God knows where we're going to be. Pre-fascist? Yeah. 
fascist? Pre-fascist. <laughs> Come on. The notion that that You're men are bad. The word. The and notion that suffered from the it. men. The notion that men are bad, and women are good is a, essentially an undemocratic notion. It's you've got to take as a Democrat. You've got to believe that over a broad range of people, you'll find the same group, the same no, proportion Walter, that's of what, good that's and your bad. problem. You keep generalizing from a very small population, which is your clients. But if you, if hold, you, hold on, if hold you on, go out, no, hang on a second. If you go out amongst, uh, for instance, a younger generation, for instance, right. I think you will find a group, uh, a gender uh, of men that is. Uh, quickly learning to speak the language of uh, their, you know, their insides, their, their inner being, and uh, who are learning to, to speak in ways that follows not just a, a male rational logic, but also uh, uh, an emotional logic as well. And they can explain themselves and do not feel this massive sense of oppression that you are suggesting is lurking over all of us as pre-fascism. Well. All right, that's your experience. Well, you're on the border. Of, of can I put an honest to goodness? Uh, can I put an honest to goodness example from what happened in the news just today about this? Steve, and Steve, can I go back to that sports question because I'll, I think I'll there's a really important one. I'll hold on my next question, and you go ahead. Yeah, because you know you talked about building men up, but really the men that are built up in the sports shows, in the teams, and so on, are the heroes. They're the performers. They're the winners. All right. Really, it's not building all men up at all. It's, it's showing a formula: succeed like this. And, and, and you'll be a great guy, which is really the same kind of pattern that women have complained about, about beautiful women in the media. You know, like, look like this, and you'll be admired and respected. This is not building up all men at all. This, okay. is, this is the old performance formula Point taken. for men. Point taken. Let me, uh, I'm going to go to my example now of what happened in the news today. And I, I confess, as we were talking about this around the, uh, around the shop today, this raised some eyebrows. Uh, there is an Olympic-level athlete that is very well known in this country, named Miriam Bedard, who has been, I gather, going through some difficulties with her ex-husband. And she, the al allegation is, uh, took off to the United States with her kid. And there is an arrest warrant out for her right now, a mm -hmm. mother who was taken off with her child. And the, the, the father, who is back here in Canada, I gather has got the police uh, involved in this right now. And That's it, pretty unusual. And would you it, agree? Exactly, it's unusual. But if it went the other way, you wouldn't say it was unusual. Well, the okay. father took off. Oh well, we'd get an arrest warrant for oh him right God. away. Walter, you know, you keep saying these extreme things. If, no, no, if but I, I, don't think, I don't think I'm if saying I anything extreme at all. I took off with my kid all. across the border. Uh, are you kidding? I don't. I don't think I'm saying anything <sighs> extreme at all. I think that from the point of view of criminal lawyers practicing in Toronto, I'm probably right in the middle. In the if I ever need my case made, I'm calling you because <laughs> you've right. got, you got the ability to go right to right to the wall on it. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Catherine, would you agree? Well, yeah. I shouldn't. I shouldn't put it this way. Is is it a more unusual situation to see a mother take off with the kid, and have the police come no, after I the mother I than the man? It's it's the police coming after the mother that's unusual. That's unusual. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. So no, I I agree with Walter on that. But I think there's another really interesting example that was in the news just last month, and that was uh, uh, a man was on a British Airways flight, and the stewardess came up to him and said that he couldn't sit there because it was company policy that a man could not sit next to two, uh, two minors. They were, they were children in the next seats. And they asked him to move. Now he turned around and he said, look, these are my kids. And the, the issue settled down. But apparently British Airways, Qantas, and Air New Zealand all have this policy. So why in the world would any man be so considered um, uh, inadequate or evil to not be allowed to sit next to a child. 